Tell yes. us a little bit about the career you had and then why you got into sales in the first place before we jump in. Yeah, I was, I was in uh, actually in the golf business, a uh, really big company, and they just had a downsizing event. And from there, I decided, you know, again, I'd always thought of getting into sales and I thought, well, this is a good opportunity. So that's what I did. So you got into sales and tell us what you sell. Well, I, right now I sell final expense life insurance. I didn't start that way. I started in mortgage protection, but I evolved into final expense life insurance. So you sell final expense life insurance. Now, some people might not know what that means. What does that mean? Yeah, it's basically insurance for people age 50 to 85 years old who don't have the money to plan for their final expenses, whether it be burial, cremation, or just leaving money to family members. So okay. this insurance takes care of that need for them. So it's like, okay, so when they pass away, it, it pays for their funeral, the cremation, if they want to leave a little bit of money for their kids or grandkids or something like that. And these are, I, I don't think these are like million dollar policies. These are more like 10, 20 grand policies or what do you know? Yeah, about? they're anywhere between, yeah, probably on average between five to $25,000, depending on the needs, but they are, they're smaller policies, but you know, the people are older, therefore the premiums are a little bit more expensive, especially yeah, for makes- people on fixed or limited incomes. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that's a lot of people who you call, right? Yes. Now, tell us, okay, so you got into this job. Okay, tell us how you get your leads. You guys have like, so they fill out some type of form or something. So, And then a lot of people call them. So you're like one of the people that calls them. How does it work for you guys? Yeah, I, I generate my own leads uh, through different different avenues. But yeah, I generate my own leads, work my own leads. Okay, so you have your own leads coming in. You're like an independent broker. You represent all these other, you know, companies that you can sell policies for, right? So you're like a 1099 insurance agent, right. so final expense insurance. Right. Okay, so you get into this field, you know, six years ago, and I think, you know, before I got on here with you, um, I was asking you some questions. So your first year, you you did pretty good. Like you got in the top ten percent of the company, right? Yeah, top 10% for new agents coming in the company. But, you know, again, I was top 10%, but I didn't really feel that successful because my my uh, standards were a little bit high, but evidently I did pretty well. Yeah, you did well. I mean, you were in the top 10%. This is before you learned any PQ or anything. I think you said you're making like 170, 180 grand a year. But then as an independent agent, you have to buy your own leads. So that yeah. takes a cut out of it. Uh, you have some expenses there. So, you know, really you're you're making like low six figures, if, if that, That's after true. all that yeah. kind of stuff. So tell us how, like when you used to sell the old, tell us how you used to sell before you started learning APQ. Just give us a background. Yeah. You know, I'm a fairly analytical guy as a rule. I kind of look at the pros and cons and that's probably not the best type of a person to sell an emotional product like life insurance. So uh, tended to be analytical and, you know, pretty much everybody out there teaches you to sell assumptively. Yeah. So that, so they, you know, they're going to buy, they're going to buy just, you just got to sell them. You got to push it. What's, what's one thing that they would teach you like to say that was like assumptive that you now are like, oh my gosh, like I lost so many sales because I kept saying that. What was something? Yeah. I'm just from the start, just assuming the sale. So, you know, so Mary, uh, I'm going to get you some information. You'll select a plan and we'll get you approved by the time we get off the phone. Yeah. Well, if, if you say that at the beginning of the call, it, it may work for 10% of the people. But the rest of the people are just going to be put on guard and then you're going to be fighting that the whole way through. Yeah. Tell us why, why in your mind, why does that put the prospect on guard? Because, hey, they filled out the form, you're calling them and you're just assuming like, hey, we're going to, by the end, we're going to put you on a plan. You're going to be able to get started. Why does that trigger sales resistance in most people? Yeah, I had that conversation with a, a gentleman yesterday that I talked with and I, I his policy was fine. I told him to keep it. And he goes, well, I'm surprised you would say that. And I said, well, you called me for help. You didn't call me to sell you a policy. So sometimes I help people by selling them a policy. Yeah. You called me for help. And that's what I'm here to do. Yeah. And um, people that, that just freaks people out because they're so used to being sold, yeah. whether they need it or not. Yeah. And Randy's not implying that you should just get on there and be like, oh, no, just keep all your policies. I mean, this is this is rare. Most of these no, this, 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 this guy had had his policy for years and there's no way to improve on it. So that's that's very, very rare. Yeah, yeah. that's very rare. I wanted to clarify that people are like, yeah. what? He's right. going to give up all the sales. How's he selling three times as much? No, it's it's all about. You know, instead of saying that, it's more in the beginning, like in the connecting questions that we've tried to use. You know, yeah, I would say the you know really the first part of this call. Joan is really more for us to find out more 
kind of about you and kind of what you have in place now, you know, if something happens and, and really I would say what you're looking for, you know, just to see if we can actually help. Cause there's some people that there's just not much we can do for them. You know what I mean by that? And so when you admit that you might not be able to help them, what does that trigger in a prospect's mind? Yeah, that's, that's one of the best phrases right there. There's some people we just can't help because they think you're going to try to sell them no matter what. Yeah. So. Yeah. So it triggers in their mind to have more trust, right? That immediately lets the guard down because if you come in and just assume like that, especially with what you sell, it might work for 10%, but for 90%, they're going to have their guard up. Now it works for the 10% because they're already going to buy anyways. That's like right. They were just going to buy, they were the golden goose, but 90% of your prospects are here, depending on your sales skills, depends on if they come over to your side of the fence or if they go on the other side of the fence and they don't buy, right? So when they feel that you're just trying to sell them something, when they feel that pressure, they immediately close down. You might have the best questions in the world, but they're not going to really open up to you on those because they feel like if they do, that you're going to use it to clobber them on the head to get them to buy something they might not want, right? Well, yeah. And you, and you said it so fast. I don't want people to miss that. You, you said being on, you said the fence, but I always say, you know, on you're on one side, they're on the other side. But what you really want to do is be on the same side of the table as them. Yeah. Yeah, ex exactly right. Now, so many, so many people have been taught that selling is uh, adversarial. It's like you against the prospect trying to win them over, you know, beat them on the head, you know, get them to buy like so you can make your commission. That's what average salespeople do in our time. I hate to tell you that. That's, you know, if you're doing that, that's why you're at the income you're at. Even if you make 150 grand a year, you're never going to be able to make more than that because you just that's the level you're going to get to that just you got to learn more advanced skills. You got to learn how to disarm the prospect. Selling is collaboration. It's you working with the prospect to help them find problems they didn't even think they had. And then once you've helped them find the problems in their mind, not by telling them, because that goes in one ear out the other, because you're biased, but by allowing them, asking the right questions that allows them to see what their real problems are. And then you actually being able to solve those problems. Selling is collaborative. If you want to be a top salesperson and make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year or more in commissions as a sales professional. If you're a business owner and you want to double your revenue or triple it or quadruple it, we have to think collaboration, not adversarial. It's completely different. Okay. Now, does that mean that when you show up on calls, you shouldn't get the sale? You don't try? No, of course not. You don't just sit there at the end and be like, hey, do you want to buy or no? Okay. Well, just call me back. But that's not going to make you sales either. Right. Okay. So when you learned how to you know, ask some of those beginning level connecting questions, because that's the first part of what we teach you in like, you know, advanced NEPQ 3.0, especially advanced inner circle. How did your prospects start to react to that? What was the change that you could see in their demeanor? Yeah, just number one, being so open. And I was never used to that in my early sales career. That, In fact, that was always my struggle. Is there some people that could get people to open up emotionally and me being that analytical person that doesn't necessarily jive well. So as I kept going further and further, I kept getting just more and more amazed how I was able to get people to open up and share their feelings and their actual needs and wants and desires and what they want to do. Yeah. And uh, it's just is really just one of the coolest things in the world as I started to figure that out for me. Yeah. And so when they started opening up to you, what do you feel like was happening in their mind that, that you didn't know how to do before? Um, really, I, I would say just to get it to think a little less analytically about that on themselves, because a lot of people would say, well, if I just save up the money, you know, I, I can do this. And you do the math on them and say, well, yeah, it'd take you 23 years to do that. And you're 73 years old, you know. So uh, the, the, the people I work with are really terrific people. I, I love them. Um, a lot of them have worked hard their whole lives and, um, they just haven't probably ended up where they wanted to be in life. So, um, they're, they're great people, yeah. but they, they, they want to do the right thing too, as they leave this world as well. Yeah. A hundred percent. So, okay. So let's, let's talk about, you know, we gave an example of a connecting question that we've taught how to use uh, situation questions. So before you started learning BQ, what would you say to find out their situation what would you do what were you saying i think it was probably just a general you know just get the bait kind of just the what is it dragnet the show just the facts ma'am right so you know kind of go right down the line and fill out a sheet 
Okay, so it's all factual, it's all with logic, right? Mm -hmm. And as we know, human beings make buying decisions based on emotion, not logic. Brain studies confirm that. There's no debate on that at this point with behavioral science. Um, problem awareness questions. So before, so now you've learned how to find, help them find out what their real problems are. Here's what we have to understand. Most prospects, even if they respond to an ad, even if they, you know, uh, you know, request information and they book a call or they're an inbound lead or an outbound lead, most of your prospects do not know what their real problems are when you first start talking to them. That's why I always tell people you can't sell to the prospect's need because prospects don't know what they need, especially in the beginning, right? As I always give this scenario, like if you go to the doctor, you've got a splitting headache, you wake up in the morning, like, oh my gosh, my head is killing me. And I've got a hundred bucks to go to the doctor and get some medication. That's all I've got. Like, here's my budget, hundred bucks. I need some headache medicine because that's my problem. That's what you think. You get to the doctor, the doctor asked you some questions and find out your symptoms and how long it's been going on and the pain and the impact and reliving that. And then he suggests that you might need a, a, a what a brain scan or what do they call cat scan or whatever they do. I think that's called, they do a cat scan and they find out you have a freaking tumor in your head that's causing the headache. And oh, by the way, that tu tumor is terminal and you've got about six months to live. And oh, by the way, your insurance is only going to cover 70% of that. So you got to come out of pocket 150 grand. Well, you know what? The hell to the budget. You're going to go out and find the money so you can actually solve the problem. But in the beginning, you didn't know what your real problem was. You thought you did. That's why you can never sell to the need. Like if somebody gets on like, oh, I need this and you just sell to that, you're doing them a disservice because they don't know what they need in the beginning. You're the expert. So your questions allow them to see what their real problems are. It allows them to see, you know, the root cause of the problem. Like how did the problem happen? And it allows them to see and feel what the problems are doing to them. We call those problem awareness questions. Before you learn those, what did you typically do to try to find out what the problems were? Give me an example. Well, I, yeah, I, I think the problem was you just kind of assume the problem because, you know, it, it'd probably be pretty standard, whether it's mortgage protection or, or final expense, you just assume that they don't want to, but everybody's got their own particular reason and their own set of life experiences. So, you know, if, if some people would just say, well, I just don't want to do that. That's just not, I, I don't want my family to do that. And then the next person might say, hey, you know, my mother died, you know, three months ago and the entire family had to chip in money yeah. to be able to do this. And in fact, we're still paying on it. Those are two totally different entire needs. Two, two different emotional needs. Or it could yeah. be that the grandma is worried that, hey, she's going to get a $25,000 policy. The funeral is going to cost ten. dollars but maybe her daughter has 15,000 in debt and she's yeah. concerned about that. That might be her need, right? So there's so many different things with you know any industry. So you can never assume that. Now, once we started teaching you problem awareness questions, give us an example of a problem awareness question we have you ask the prospect now to help them figure out what the real problems are in their own mind. Yeah, so if they didn't have a policy, you'd say something. So do you want your brother to have to pay for this when you do pass away? Yeah. And you would find that out in the situation questions That's that right. they don't have a policy. And you, I think you, we had you, we have you ask them like, well, okay, what, what type of financial investments do you have in place to actually pay for the funeral? And they might say, well, my brother's going to pay for it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what they might say. And so that problem awareness question would be the first one question. So do you, do you want your brother to have to pay for your funeral? Now, are most people going to say yes, or they're probably going to be like, no, I don't want him to pay, right? That's right. What typically happens at that point? Uh, they're they're going to say no. I mean, ultimately, that's why you're on the phone, but then you can go from there and dig a little bit deeper. Okay, but not having him pay, why Why is that so important to you, though? Right? See, that's a probe, an NPQ probe that we've taught you, okay? Now, typically, when we've taught you how to really clarify and probe, because here's, here's how he's always breaking down. Average salespeople, average, any average salesperson can find out a prospect's problems, okay? Good salespeople, okay, like really good salespeople can help them find their problem, but also help them see the root cause of how the problem happened. The very best salespeople of all are able to do both of those things, but then most importantly, help them feel how the problems are affecting them personally. And that's where change comes from.
Okay. So as we taught you to clarify and probe, okay, um, how have prospects, how have you noticed, have you noticed prospects opening up to you? Give us some examples of like how that's changing for you now. Yeah, it's, um, it's just interesting when you, when you open that kind of create a safe zone. And one of my favorite words is, you know, the possibly. So, you know, to, to, if this were possibly to work for you, well, most people would know that it does work for them. It just comes down to the money. And then, well, you know, if we could possibly find something that fits in your budget. So just backing down the pressure and, and I'm not sure I kind of answered your question there, but well, no, it's it's true. You're you're getting them to open. When you say that you're getting them to be in their safe zone, that's important because now they trust you, right? Yeah. If they don't trust you, they're not going to buy from you. Nobody buys from somebody they don't trust. That's extremely rare, very rare. Okay, they buy from people they trust. Okay, trust can get them the results that they want. People don't buy that. It's an old myth. You know this. Dale Carnegie book from 1936, How to Win Friends and Influence People is a great book, but it was for people in 1936. The, the consumers are, com are way different than they are in 1936 because of the power of the internet, social media, they know they have many choices to choose the exact product or service you sell. And because of that, they'll no longer be manipulated by pushy, high pressure salespeople because they know they have so many choices to choose from, okay? So we have to get them to open up. We have to get them to disarm. We have, have Always need to follow what we call the ABDs, ABDs of selling. Always be disarming. We're continually disarming them throughout the entire sales process, whether that's a one call close, two call close, maybe a four or five meeting close, a complex sound environment where it's like six months. We're continually disarming them all the way, even after they send the funding in, if that makes sense. Okay. Now let's talk about your solution awareness questions. So solution awareness questions, as you know, that we've taught you, uh, get the prospect to start to see that here's their current situation, okay, that we found out with our situation questions, okay? We help them build a gap in their mind of where they are compared to where they want to be by a problem awareness. So that's all these problems that they're now seeing that they have that they maybe didn't think they had before. And now we want them to get them to see what their future is going to look like once all of these problems are solved, right? We call that their objective state. Those are solution awareness questions. Um, what, give us an example of maybe a solution awareness question that we taught you and kind of the result and how people react to that. Yeah. So it'd be, well, Jeremy, suppose we could get you a policy that would provide that money for your brother so that he wouldn't have to pay this for you. I mean, what would that financial protection do for your brother? And then yeah. you would follow that up and go, well, what would that do for you personally? And what people, how do people react to that usually? Yeah, they're very open. I mean, they're just very honest and just it, it comes from the heart. Yeah. Yeah. So they start to open up. You the, the main thing when people when you when you because you can't just ask like surface level questions, you know, th those are great questions. But then we have to probe. We have to clarify and probe off their answers to pull out more pain. We have to help them relive the pain. OK, when they relive the pain, human behavior 101 tells you that people want to get away from that pain, okay? So no matter what we sell, we're either solving an emotional need. Let's say somebody's buying a Lamborghini that solves an emotional need because if they just wanted to go from point A to point B, they just drive a Kia, right? You wouldn't buy a $400,000 car. But buying a Lambo solves an emotional need, maybe more high status. They want people to view them a certain way. That solves an emotional need, whereas insurance would solve emotional need but also like a logistical need and financial need, right? So there's many different uh, problems that your product and service solve there. Okay, talk about consequence questions with us. When you learn consequence questions, what was going on in your mind? Um, was When I learned it, I just believed that it was part of the process. So I just kind of bought all in on you. But, you know, when you're talking to the client, you kind of visit the the other side of action. You can either do something or not do something. So, you know, you go, well, you know, what are you going to do if nothing changes and you don't do anything about this and you die a lot sooner than you think? And then your brother ends up getting stuck paying for this. Yeah. So what happens to your brother if you don't do anything about this? You end up passing away, say, five years before you thought you did. And then your brother ends up having to pay for all that. What happens then? See, even with insurance, it's almost like you relate it to the person that's going to have to 
bear all the weight. And with mm-hmm. most people, they're, they just don't want that to happen. What do they typically say when you ask those questions? Yeah, they just go, yeah, I, I don't want that to happen. I don't want to be a burden. This is not their responsibility. Okay, so time to time to make a change possibly. See, what Randy did there with that, just one consequence question is he helps the prospect question their way of thinking that's allowed the situation to keep happening. Okay, that builds urgency in a human brain's mind that they need to do something about this now, not down the road. Okay, so you don't, like, before you learned all that, when you would get to the end, how many people would say, oh, this sounds good, but I need to think it over. I need to keep getting more quotes. Like, how many people would typically say that to you before any could you? Yeah, I mean, that was always the worry. Like, that's the number one biggest problem folks have. So, you know, just, you know, back in the day, that was more often than not. So, yeah. yeah. And, okay, let's say now, so let's say out of 10 people, how many before you learn anything, you had let's say ten people. How many would give you that objection? Like, I need to think it over, or I need to get back to you. Just give us a percentage. Well, I, maybe, maybe the other side of that is what my kind of close ratio in presentations was. So, okay. you know, back then, maybe thirty to forty plus percentage point would and every presentation would result in a sale. Well, in December, you know, towards the end of the NEP program. December, which is the busiest month, they got the most stuff going through their head, the most distractions and everything. Yeah. Of my presentations, I was closing 70 to 75% making a sale. And December is one of the lowest months of the year for most sales. You know, if you're buying Christmas candles, it's probably a good time. But for insurance, most people aren't thinking of final expense insurance a week before Santa Claus comes. So going from 30% to 75%, so that, you know, takes away most objections. Now, when we've taught you how to ask certain questions in the conversation that prevent a lot of those objections from happening, what has that done for your your sales and your calls? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, sales have gone up, but I think it reduces a lot of stress on the sales agent too. Tell us about that. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, you know, everybody's probably heard the word commission breath, right? If you're not making any sales, you got to make that sale to... You know, so if you can come into the situation and pull the pressure out of it, both on the client and on you, yeah, all sales are just naturally going to happen easier. Yeah. So you're getting a lot more lay down sales, what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Lay down sales are a lot better. Like if you're only getting like, let's say out of every 10 sales you get, you get one lay down. It's because you're triggering sales resistance in most people. Yeah. Like when we typically teach NPQ to clients and they start to grasp it and use it and understand it they're probably getting three, four, five times as many lay down sales. And so you don't go at the end of the day feeling like you've been in a boxing ring with a prospect, throwing punches at each other because they keep throwing objections at you and you got to respond to the objection and do this and you got to hard close them or chase them. It's like you're always stressed and anxiety and frustration. When you learn APQ, selling becomes easy because you're going to learn how to get the prospect to pull you in rather than you push them. And won't, don't you want to be pulled in by the prospect rather than you trying to push them? Yeah. All right. Tell us about commitment questions. So we, you know, we restructured your presentation. We won't, we don't have time to go through all that right now. So you got a three-step formula used for that. Um, tell us how are you getting them to commit to take action compared to what you used to do before? Yeah, you mean as far as like making that final decision on a policy? Yep. Yeah. So I just, I just ask the question once we've gone through everything i said so do you think do you think the twenty five thousand dollars could be the answer for you yeah yeah do you feel like the do you feel like the twenty five thousand dollar policy could be the answer for you right it's a commitment question and how do they typically respond to that um yeah they'll either say yes or no if they say no you can you can work on some other coverage amounts if they say yes you go well, why do you feel it is though? Yeah. So it's an NPQ probing question. And then they tell you and themselves why they feel like it's what they're wanting, which double confirms them, gets them more internally motivated to take action. All right. So Randy, that was a good interview. I just wanted to bring you on here for 30, 35 minutes and kind of break down your sales process. Uh, any last words of advice you would want to give a salesperson or a coach or maybe an entrepreneur listening to you right now that's thinking like, hey, should I... Should I get involved in the training? Do I need to learn more advanced skills? Can I really sell more? I'm already doing good. Can I sell more? What advice would you give people? 
Yeah, I look for training like this as as we talked a little bit before for for many years, and it's just I couldn't find it out there in the insurance industry. Sure. Um, so I, I had to go out and I had to do it on my own. I had to invest in myself. Yeah. And just you know, it, it really wasn't a leap of faith because I, you know, looking at everything you've done in the program, I knew it would work. It's just <laughs> we only it, have it, almost five thousand testimonials in the first two years, but I guess yeah. they all got lucky. You yeah. Can- yeah, it's just a process. It's a process to unwire your brain that you've thought your entire life that way and kind of go a different direction. So I kind of feel like I'm only about 20% there. You but, are. I, yeah. I keep telling you, like, dude, you, you're you more than doubled your closing percentages, which obviously we know what that does to your income and your commissions. But I'm like, dude, you probably have only got about 20 to 25% of this down. Like six months from now, you're going to have more than 50 or 60% down. And you're going to be pretty deadly. All right. You better be happy. Merry Christmas. Now, I always ask this question. Are you married? Yes. Okay. I always ask this question. So I know if if seventh level is doing the job right, is your spouse happy with the training and with us as a company? Yes. She's she's very pleased. Yes. Thank you. We always know if we've done our job right, the (laughs) other spouse is really happy with the increased commissions and the increased happiness when we go in and train their spouse or their company or whoever they are. So that, that makes me happy. So Randy, thanks for being on. It was a pleasure. Keep working. Uh, You're only getting better every day. Well done. And congratulations on your results. Appreciate it. Hey guys, if you enjoyed these, here's another, you can watch right over here, right over here, join our free sales revolution group. Click the link below, join us and we're going to help you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you real soon.